Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming along. My name is David Legg. Uh, I tweet, perhaps too prolifically, uh, at events like this under the Code Cleaner. Um, you know the date, so I don't need to tell you that. Uh, and we're at Agile on the Beach, and you know that as well. So, uh, as I mentioned, I tweet as the Code Cleaner. Um, some of you may know uh, or may realize that that's come from uh, the Bob Martin book, um, Clean Code. Uh, I was given that, uh, I think it was about 2010, um, and it did have quite a revelatory uh, effect on my uh, career. Um, part of uh, it, because I'm British, I think statements like that make me feel a bit um, nervous, but uh, yes, it, it is true. So uh, for the last about 10 years, I've been the code cleaner, um, and I've worked around various places in Cambridge uh, and helping them turn around big balls of mud, um, code bases that have just gone to pot, uh, and try and turn that around and get it delivered, uh, delivering value, um, and start to, to see some uh, return on their investment in that code base. It's become a recur it became a recurring theme. Uh, I went to a number of different places uh, and did the same thing, and it became my um, USP. Um, and in fact, sometimes when I was hired, people on the first few days would say, I'm really sorry about this code base, but it, it wasn't me, honest. Um, and we'd, uh, we'd work together and we'd start sorting it out. In the last year, uh, since the last uh, Agile on the Beach, uh, I've actually joined Redgate. Um, and that's, it's a really nice place to work uh, and uh, really good values alignment. Uh, and uh, I've been really enjoying it there, <coughs> uh, bringing some of, uh, some of my experience to them. Um, for the record, uh, I'm leading a team uh, working on new adventures into Oracle for Redgate. They've, their history is um, the SQL Server stack. Um, and uh, they have tinkered with Oracle and uh, MySQL and Postgres in the past, but uh, they, a few years ago they, they focused back onto Red SQL Server um, when they'd uh, had a bit of a lean period. So this talk really is inspired by uh, having come across this phrase quite a few times. Um, as I say, it kind of echoes across the industry. Um, you hear it all the time. Uh, sometimes it's developers, sometimes it's managers or, or whoever. Product owners, product managers, designers. Um, let's just rewrite this. It's seen as the answer to all ills. Um, and sometimes it's tossed out there not really understanding the risks involved and quite what a, uh, a decision with such serious consequences can have. Uh, and this talk is here to uh, explore that. So, uh, two years ago, I came into a company uh, as for the last six months of um, a project, a rewrite, um, that had been five years in the making. Um, and apparently the uh, product owner manager had been swearing for a good three years of that that it would be released the next month. Um, I, uh, I actually came in and... Uh, it was a scrum master to, uh, to a team to allow the existing scrum master who was doing it part-time to concentrate on the, uh, his uh, testing role that he was more in. Um, and uh, there was a big, big push towards the end, and for some definition of November, we got it out of the door. Um, and it was a bit too much like uh, the final, well, not the final scene in Lord of the Rings, where Sam and Frodo managed to get the ring cast into Mount Doom. Everyone is a shadow of themselves afterwards. And having got that out the door, having spent five years doing that, actually, they only were delivering 30 to 40% of the existing functionality. Um, this major engineering effort was actually required to make it work alongside the legacy uh, software that they already had. Uh, and actually, that distracted them, I think, um, quite a lot from actually delivering the value of, an, of a rewrite. Um, I, uh, I came across uh, Mary and Tom Poppendike's book uh, a few months ago and uh, put it into my uh, reading list. Um, and eventually, a few weeks ago, it actually reached the top and I was reading it. And uh, in preparation for this talk, I came across this quote. So 
Rewriting legacy software is an attractive approach for managers who dream of walking into their office one day and finding all of their problems have disappeared as if by magic. Um, that's in implementing lean software development. Um, and in the run-up to this talk, I <laughs> just thought uh, that hit a nail on the head. So what are the options? Um, so we've, we've talked about rewrite already. Um, in the title of this talk, uh, when I submitted it many months ago, I had rework. Um, I'll explore that later. Uh, refactor is also mentioned. Um, a couple of other options are strangle, uh, which um, is explicitly mentioned by the Pop and Dykes in their book. Um, and I've thrown in one delete, um, as uh, we'll come to later. So, uh, yes, should we rewrite? Well, let's have a look at the risks. So what are they? So there's a, um, a fairly uh, well-known blog post actually written, um, I think it was about 2000, plus or minus a year or two, by Joel Spolsky, um, who says that the single worst strategic mistake that any software company can make is to do a rewrite. The actual case study there he's talking about is Netscape moving straight from version 4 to version 6. I don't know, perhaps they were just um, copying the IP protocols, but they skipped one. Um, but he obviously had some strong thoughts on it. So in that paper, um, uh, which is, uh, is well known, but uh, you know, is, is some, time, some old now, um, he makes the point there's absolutely no reason to believe that you're going to do a better job in the rewrite than you are in the original. Um, which uh, reminded me of this quote, um, which I'm nervous of because uh, I, I can't remember how, where it cropped up in the last year. But um, there was a theory that every quote um, eventually gets attributed to either Winston Churchill or Albert Einstein. And, and possibly... Um, uh, Eisenhower either as well, but um, those who do not learn, f learn from history are doomed to repeat it, um, which reportedly was said by uh, somebody called jo George Santayana, Santayana? in 1905, but was said by Winston Churchill in the House of Commons in 1948. Um, it's very difficult to find the exact wording that was used. Um, I don't know if the original quote was in English, so perhaps it's a translation thing, but uh, the sentiment's there. And what this is saying to me is that if you've re written spaghetti code once, what's to stop spaghetti code again? Uh, this actually triggered another memory um, by uh, a, a tweet from Kevlin Henney some years ago. Um, a common fallacy is to assume authors of incomprehensible code will somehow be able to express themselves lucidly and clearly in comments. Um, but of course, this is a case it's the rewrite. So uh, what this is saying is that there, if you go into rewrite, there needs to be some uh, process of improvement is required so you don't just repeat the uh, mistakes of the past. Um, this can be referred to as sharpening the saw, one of the um, seven habits um, by Stephen Covey. Uh, Add learning, basically. Um, if you're going to do it, uh, you need to take your time and uh, add some learning to the process. Another source of this is that, um, sorry for the conference bingo, Conway's law says that the organization produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations which is saying that unless you actually change the structure of the organization, you might find that your rewrite will actually be exactly the, have the same uh, problems as, uh, as the new version, as the old version, sorry. Uh, and I do love this cartoon um, with uh, the structure of a number of different well-known companies. So does the organization itself need to change to allow the software to be better than it was in the previous attempt? So what are, what are uh, the other risks? The accidental becomes the essential. And what do I mean by this? So the essential 
is the actual domain problem you are trying to solve, and that's it. Just the, the nugget of the problem you're attempting to solve. The accidental is what we pile on top of it. It's the frameworks, it's security, which obviously is uh, incredibly important, but it, it's not actually solving the problem, it's just supporting it. Um, any uh, spaghetti code, any accidental, any other complexity you add on to that, that is all accidental complexity. Uh, and as Martin Fowler uh, points out, when you do a rewrite, all too often you find you're even transplanting the old bugs, the workarounds that people have put in over time, over the years, um, actually are now expected of it and now get transferred into the, into the rewritten software. I think this is a, a symptom of entropy, which is a measure of disorder. Uh, and the law of entropy states that entropy increases unless you work against it. So unless you actively try and reduce the complexity in your system, it will inevitably balloon. Um, it's also a function of scope creep. So uh, another, another risk. Um, and this uh, did raise a wry smile. Uh, can anyone spot the difference? So, this pie chart shows either a study of four internal projects in a company, over here, or it shows a study of 2,000 projects at 1,000 companies over here. I just find the numbers a little suspicious that they happen to be exactly the same. <laughs> um, there's some, some good debate on the, uh, on the internet if should you uh, wish to go and uh, look these up. Um, so I'm taking the numbers with a bit of a pinch of salt, but I think the salient point here is that um, some percentage of features are rarely or never used, uh, and you can uh, get into a conversation about how much, but um, there's any, any software you are right is likely to have some features that are just never touched. And actually for that, add a huge amount of complexity for it, which deliver no value. So perhaps we should just delete some of that to make the whole process easier, uh, which is the delete I mentioned earlier. So as I said, um, every Every quote ever can be attributed to Winston Churchill or Albert Einstein. I believe he did actually say this one, but I could be proven wrong. The definition of genius is taking the complex and making it simple. All too often, any genius I've met has loaded on complexity in spades. Did I say I worked in Cambridge? <laughs> Batch size. Um, so for a rewrite, what... Uh, we've spent a lot of this conference talking about is reducing batch size to as small as possible, single piece flow, if at all possible. Um, a rewrite does not give you that. As uh, Alan Kelly, who isn't in here, I don't think, uh, says, software has diseconomies of scale, which is one of my favorite quotes of the last few years, and I do, uh, do bang on it about too much. But basically, doing a rewrite is one massive batch size. Another risk, there will be an inherent gap in delivery of value, which is uh, tied up with a batch size. Um, a, a study on the internet I found by someone called Uma Mansour um, from the States, um, it's a bit of a, a retrospective um, on, uh, on a rewrite that the, they undertook. They got a, an, an actual product out the door and then immediately started to rewrite it. Um, and that took some time. Uh, it's an interesting read. But he says, at the end, we missed real opportunities um, in ways to both to for other customers, but also to service the customers they had already, received, uh, already got. Um, they turned down adding features for them or adding better features for them or improving the features for them because they were working on a rewrite rather than uh, concentrating on, uh, on sorting out the issues they already had. This is the opportunity cost of not doing something else. And uh, to return to Joel Spolsky, um, who says, you're gifting two or three years to your competition, to your competitors. 
um, in the five-year rewrite, uh, that shows you that they were giving, gifting five years to their competition. Uh, when I, I tweeted something recently, uh, one of my colleagues at Redgate replied that, um, that he had shit, they'd been involved in an 18-month rewrite that turned into seven years. So, are there any more risks? Well, when you're doing this, what about the original? Uma Mansour commented that we didn't fully anticipate that the need to maintain the original system in parallel with the, uh, with the new system. <clears throat> uh, so, really, there's, there's two options here. One is just to abandon the original, let it rot, uh, provide minimal to no support, which risks upsetting your customers uh, that you've already got, um, and a customer lost is, is not a good thing. Um, neglected work is a thief of time, if anyone's read Making Work Visible by Dominica Demendez. Um, it's an extremely good book, uh, as well written as Accelerate in my, in my book, and I'm planning to uh, evangelize about it after this talk's out of the way. Uh, you lose expertise. Uh, you lose out to your competitors, and you can't react to changes um, that uh, really your existing solu um, solution might have been able to uh, deal with because you're focused on the rewrite. <clears throat> uh, the second option is to continue to develop the existing, but that just creates a, re uh, a moving target for your rewrite. Uh, it also duplicates effort. You're putting in a feature here, and you're putting in a feature in here. That's duplicating it. Um, and, and I've seen this. Um, there's even less motivation for well-written code in the existing solution. Um, so, you know, developers say, well, we're, it's dying in, you know, a few months' time. Why would I, you know, I'll just put this quick hack in. Why would I want to do this properly? You know, I want a shot of it. Uh, and you really see people unwilling to work on a legacy product. Um, once the focus has gone onto the new shiny technology, the new project that uh, is, uh, will answer all ills. Um, so, and there's, there's also an option. Do you, uh, does one team uh, write the rewrite and look after the old one, or do you um, have two teams? Are you doubling your costs for the, for the whole solution as a whole? If somebody is put onto the uh, the legacy code, do they see that favoritism on the on the other parts? Uh, are you going to lose their most of motivation, um, cost of running two teams? And if you have two teams, are they going to share the knowledge um, as they should? So, are, are there any more risks? Well, to return to Umar Mansour points out that systems rewritten from scratch actually offer no value to the user. If they're, ex in, if they're solving exactly the same problems, then what is in it, what is in it for a new customer? Uh, for a customer, it's, it, there's no value to it, um, so why bother? And finally, um, what he found was that actually, eventually, when they produced the rewrite, the customer just said no, they didn't want to use the upgrade, they'd rather stick with the legacy one, they didn't want the risk. So, a little thought experiment. Why not invest the same amount of time and effort into the existing solution as you were going to put into a rewrite? Or, if you want, why not invest 50% of the time, same amount of time and effort into the existing that you're going to put into rewrite? Will that actually allow you to uh, solve the problems you've, you have with the existing solution? Uh, and uh, the star there does note a term and condition. Uh, this does not account for Hofstadter's law. And Hofstadter's law says that it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstadter's law. I do like the self-referential. So, um, an alternative, the refactor. How might you go about that? So, as I say, if you, perhaps you could give yourself 50% of the time you would have been spending on the rewrite uh, to, uh, to look at refactoring the existing. Um, so, and you might do that by actually modernizing the, uh, the way in which you deliver it. Uh, just start applying continuous delivery practice from this book, which has already been mentioned a few times in this conference. Um, 
accelerate, focus on technical excellence, actually apply some rigor to your existing solution rather than chasing a rainbow of a rewrite. This quote is actually in the, uh, the appendix uh, when I found it. Um, As loosely coupled, well encapsulated architecture drives IT performance. In the 27 data set, 17, sorry, data set, this was the biggest contributor to continuous delivery. Obviously, if you're doing the refactor, this book immediately comes to mind, uh, working effectively with legacy code. Um, I read this book, uh, it was some time ago, I I think it was after I'd read Clean Code. Um, I had a good reading list that year. Um, I was reading it uh, one weekend um, at my parents' house, uh, we visiting them. I think it was uh, my brother's wedding, in fact, uh, and I was sat in the front room looking at this, uh, reading the book, uh, and my dad walked in and uh, clocked the title of the book and came up with this gem, I've never wrote, written any other sort. So, um, working effectively with legacy code gives you a number of uh, tools in your toolbox to go about um, taking control and having confidence of dealing with a legacy code. Um, but um, basically, uh, it's many, many ways of getting the system under tests, looking for seams in the software that you might be able to test. Um, just this very morning, I was speaking to uh, someone um, in, the, in the audience who was describing they were having to do this against some uh, pushback against some of the senior developers in the um, uh, company, but that's, that's another story. Um, but the first step, really, is to get the system under test so you have confidence in your changes. Once you have them under control, then you can start refactoring, pulling out, uh, making, working on the code, making it better. Um, and I've uh, outlined a two-stage process here, so obviously the third stage is going to be profit. I, find, I have found uh, in many places um, the, the code base gets so big and uh, people don't have the understanding. Actually, they start becoming, thinking of the software, it, that it's actually stoneware handed down to them, uh, chiseled in uh, tablets of stone, and they're not allowed to change it. One of the uh, techniques actually outlined in uh, Michael Feather's book is, um, uh, well, I, I term it uh, refactoring for understanding. I can honestly say I get a better understanding of how an existing system works by just having a go at refactoring it, even if I revert it. And uh, it, it's the same mentality that they're not allowed to change code. Developers, um, um, this sounds a bit... Uh, yes, but sometimes revert can be the hardest word. <laughs> People just don't like doing it. But you can gain that understanding, you can throw it away, you can revert it, you've got a better understanding of it, so when, and have another go. You could you treat that as a prototype, have another go at it, and you're making progress. So what are the, the sunny uplands, uh, to paraphrase someone, um, that you might be aiming for in a refactoring? Well just starting to decouple and decompose the system um, so into um, cognitive chunks so you can actually reason about the system. Um, it may be you want to go for microservices. I'm not saying you have to. Uh, it's certainly the modern way, um, but it might force you into that breaking down of systems. Even if you don't want to go for microservices, sometimes uh, within a monolith, if you um, break it down into different subsections of it, as um, Simon Brown talked about yesterday, if you've got a dotted box, the different concepts should be present in your code base rather than just one big mess. Enforcing interfaces and, and APIs to, uh, to um, design by contract uh, to really enforce separation and encapsulation of um, systems, uh, subsystems within your uh, process. Dep adding in dependency injection might be, well be a good way to decouple the, the architecture. Um, a classic example of when you have a big ball of mud actually starting to split out the separate bounded contexts. Um, and a bounded context um, is, comes from the, the DDD, um, domain-driven design world, of just having the related items in one place. Uh, and you might have, again, your essential complexity is one um, bounded context, whilst your users, 
systems and security might be another one, uh, scheduling might be another. They don't need to live in the same place, they're separate concerns. Separation of concerns being an important thing here. Working out what features are actually used, um, going back to the, uh, the unused features from earlier. And working out what the smallest piece of, that delivers value is uh, might be the place to start. So I've mentioned uh, rework, uh, and what do I mean by rework? Um, another term I juggled with um, is re-engineer. Um, and uh, what I'm getting at here basically is creative destruction. Um, so refactoring has a specific meaning, and that's uh, in my head. It's kind of having a, a piece of string and holding the input and the output at two ends. And as long as you keep it doing exactly the same, then you can do whatever you want in the middle. So you can start to straighten out the pieces of string, if you will, um, like having a knot. But that implies that you have the tests in the, place, in the first place, so you know when you've broken something. Sometimes, just sometimes, that isn't possible. And actually, you want to hit it with a very big hammer, decompose it, and then put it back together. It might be you want, you want to shift two microservices. So you take that bit there, cut out the, with a scalpel the business logic, put it in over here. That bit over there lives over there. So there's some creative destruction there. Um, you can't say that you, you're refactoring because you, haven't, you can't really write tests that encapsulate that bigger change. Um, you might be able to, um, but very often not. But it's a case of um, throwing all the cards up in the air, sorting them out when they land. Um, it's not particularly agile, but sometimes uh, when needs must. And I would say there, actually, that presents you with the, uh, the same kind of uh, places you should be aiming for. Um, that might be a way to get to microservices from some big monolith. Um, I, I did use this technique some years ago um, on an on a algorithmic model to predict, in fact, to predict potato crop yields. Um, uh, and the, but the, the, the logic was so broken, actually, I just had to split it out and then sort it out when we got there so we could actually validate the model worked. People had just started tinkering with the model and it wasn't, it wasn't validatable. So, would anybody like to suggest why you might want to rewrite? Maybe something about the technology that you'd like to gone totally out of support. Yeah, okay, so obsolete technology. Yes, absolutely. Uh, anyone else? <laughs> the person, the genius, I'm going to interpret that as um, that originally wrote it, has left, and it's just incomprehensible to anyone else. Did I say I worked in Cambridge? So, yes, I, uh, I had an hon honest conversation with myself about what are the legitimate reasons to rewrite. Uh, this is the list of, uh, that I came up with. Some of them are variations on the other. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but um, I actually worked one place where they didn't have the source code. Um, <laughs> yes, quite. Um, uh, I think they might well have lost the heart password. They had to have a computer on the right IP address for the whole system to work. Um, one power outage was going to sync this, uh, this system. So lost password, I mean, that's the, the person under the bus scenario. If they're the only person that were allowed the password, they were the shining one, um, then, you know, uh, there's a problem. Obsolete hardware, thank you, was down there. Obsolete language, so to be fair to the place I, was, I talked about originally, actually, uh, their, their legacy system was written in Delphi. Um, and uh, they needed to be able, they just couldn't recruit people. Um, although I found it slightly ironic because uh, once we'd got the delivery out the door, uh, there was a, a, a project to move them from SVN onto GitHub, and actually the Delphi developers were all up for it. It was the C Sharp developers that were, oh, I don't want to move that. Why do we want to move that? That's come. Um, <coughs> it was, uh, it was uh, interesting. Uh, recruitment, I mentioned, and there's going to be some security flaw. Uh, compliance risk, business risk, single point of view. dead end architecture. There's just no way to get that from from there to another. Um, which perhaps you might want to think about um, doing the uh, the rework, re-engineer rather than the rewrite. But it is you know, performance. Just can't do it. Spaghetti ball of mud, untestable. Uh, the business process change has actually just changed so much that actually the old system um, can't keep up with it, uh, and there's just no not 
delivering value anymore. Technical debt is often uh, quoted, but if you chip away at that, you can, you can make dents in it. Stop doing um, appropriate scaling. So, so uh, there are examples, and you can go and read about them, how Facebook have rewritten their system 30, whatever it is, 13 times, and, but they've got the uh, liquidity of people. They can throw people at a project to get it out the door if they really need to. Uh, we're not all uh, Facebook or Twitter. Uh, unsupported dependencies, variations on something that you just cannot change because it breaks. Um, it's kind of drifted into the chaotic section of the Knevin model. Um, you change a single thing over here, and something over here breaks. Um, if anyone knows the story of the, uh, the Knight Capital, um, where uh, an unused flag um, lo lost them 45 million in 45 minutes or something ridiculous. So how might you go about a rewrite? <clears throat> um, so identify the essential bounded context. It's very much dissimilar, actually. Uh, what features are actually used? And look for the smallest piece, piece that delivers value. You really need to be going about it in a lean, agile way to um, minimize the length of delay between delivering something that works. Um, so you can start building on top of that. Uh, in the realms of MVP. Uh, again, you really need a decoupled architecture, and if you are taking it, you must, I would say you must separate the user interface. So then you can change, throw that away and put something else the next afternoon when a new Java um, script framework comes out. Again, you might take the opportunity to uh, go for microservices, APIs, clean interface, and again, dependency injection. So the strangler pattern um, is, uh, is oft quoted. Uh, Martin Fowler wrote a seminal um, blog post on this. I think it might have been 2004. Um, and uh, then uh, there's uh, a link from that. He's actually just changed the name this year to the Strangler Fig um, pattern, uh, interestingly. Um, I noticed when I was uh, researching this. So is it a win-win? Um, quite often it is. Um, but as I mentioned in my original example, um, you've got to be careful that you don't put significant, you don't end up putting massive amounts of effort into be able to dual running, because then you destroy all the benefit you were getting from it. Um, and it's whether you can slice the functionality vertically or horizontally in the load balancing which is involved. Uh, and in that case, yes, significant effort went to splitting across the two systems, thus destroying any advantage they might have had. Uh, Paul Hammond, which is linked from the, uh, the Kent Beck um, uh, blog post, provides some case studies where they've done this. Uh, and I did like this quote um, near the bottom of that, is, we relied on making the system so compelling, there was no reason to use the old one. They didn't force anyone to migrate from one to the other, but over time they did because actually it was just nicer to use. That's actually adding some value to the rewrite, although it was done through the strangle pattern. So, in summary, um, you, yes, you can rewrite, and there are legitimate reasons to do it. Um, there's a guy that uh, takes offense on Twitter to anyone that ever says never or all, um, always comes up with a counterexample, and that's exactly right. So, yes, when you have obsolete technology, you have lost the source code. There is a passcode, the password that you've lost. Whatever it was, sometimes it, it is a legitimate decision to rewrite, but it is high risk. You are running to stay still. Um, but it is also an opportunity, and I would suggest you should take it, to ditch complexity. Take out the uh, functionality that isn't used. Keep it really simple. Deliver in a lean, agile way an MVP, and then build upon that so you can start to cut people across. Don't repeat history. So rework, which I presented, um, I would regard as less risk but there is a discontinuity in testing. You're taking all the business logic and putting it in here and then sorting it out. So you're not saying that you're moving in small steps, but it is a smaller step than doing a full rewrite. <clears throat> uh, so a, a strangle is a blended approach. Um, just be careful that you don't end up doing excessive integration work to get the two things to play nicely together. Uh, that's where they fall, fell down. 
um, but it is certainly a, a, an approach that um, has a lot of value to it. Refactoring, um, and uh, as the code cleaner, this is obviously the one I'd go for. Um, it can be painstaking, and, and it sometimes feel a bit dull, but actually I, I have always found great satisfaction from turning a big pile of mud over here into something that it, we can ship and start delivering value. Um, I don't know if it's the kind of the crossword puzzle um, it, solver in me. Um, it's really satisfying. It can feel slow, and it but it minimizes the risk. And whilst it feels slow, actually, the control experiment of if you'd started rewriting it, is it actually going to take you two years longer than it would have to uh, refactor it? And then the deletion, uh, which I suggested, just get rid of the functionalities that are not used. Uh, that might actually, you might well find that that reduces the complexity of the code base. And as we said, as we dis discussed, um, some percentage of those, which may or may not be these numbers, um, are never used. Just delete them. Thank you very much.